uh, we are planning to uh, go to the next church, maybe the last church, that is the seventh one, the church at Laodicea. The church at, you can call it as the Laodicea or Laodicea, okay? So in, in two ways you can call that church. In Malayalam it is Laodicea, but in English uh, Laodicea or Laodicea you can call it. Okay, so, so that is from book of Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 through 22. Book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. We will read that portion first, then we will try to explain all those things. Amen. So we will read Revelation, chapter 3, uh, verses 14 through 20, 22. Yeah. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen and the faithful true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would you would that you either cold or hot? So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered. I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pit, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich in white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and slave to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove the discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Very good. Thank you, Elsa. And so this is about the seventh church of the Asia Minor, that is the church at Laodicea from Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. So I think uh, we'll be able to complete chapter 3 and the study about the seven churches of Asia Minor today itself. And uh, we will be uh, just moving into the fourth chapter next week onwards. So uh, when we think about the church at uh, Laodicea, we understand this is the church which is known as the lukewarm church. Okay, there are there are three names you can give for this church. That is the lukewarm church, and also the rich and the poor church. The rich and poor church, and the lukewarm church. Okay, so we will be uh, going into that portion uh, maybe later. Now, the first point, the first I mean point number A, is uh, uh, the city where the church was located. So this is the system that we are continuing for every churches. You know, we have been studying uh, or, or man, first uh, the, 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 the city where the church was located. So here also, we are coming to that point, the city where the church was <laughs> located. That is the point number A of uh, 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 the study of the church at Laodicea. Okay, so uh, you, can, you can get one I mean, picture of uh, uh, the ancient uh, city of Laodicea. This is the this is the sorry. This is the modern uh, modern picture of uh, the city of Laodicea. Uh, you can see that uh, in the in the screen now. Yeah, this is the I mean uh, Laodicea city. Uh, this is the modern city. Uh, the ancient city was different. Okay, so now um, you may be uh, actually you may be I mean uh, having a question uh, in your mind that in order to study the message. Uh, message to the church. Okay, now we are studying about the message to the church. Now you may be asking one question: Why should we discuss about the about the city where the church was located, and what do, to, how, what is the need of the study of the uh, historical and geographical backgrounds of the places? Okay, maybe etc. Okay, uh, that question may come into your mind: That why should we study about all these things? When we, when we go through the uh, messages to the churches. So Jesus is giving uh, uh, special messages to the each church and why we should study and why we should discuss about the uh, historical background and geographical background and uh, uh, what, is the, what was the city, the situation of the city uh, where the church was located. 
So I will tell you uh, why we are doing in that way. Uh, the reason is, you know, each word that Jesus is using here, when he is speaking to each church, is very important. And those words are really closely related to the culture and the government and the belief systems and also the geography of that city. You know, when you study about each churches and the messages which was given for each churches, you will understand that Jesus is using some kind of words and some kind of phrases in that message. So when he is uh, speaking that word or that, I mean, speaking that message to that, I mean, church, it is very important uh, that, uh, that words are really close related to the culture and the government and the belief system and the geographical uh, situation of that city. So that's the reason that we are emphasizing in, in the, I mean, studying about the city where the uh, church is located. So we will go to the uh, explanation about the, the specialities of the city of Laodicea. Okay, now the city of Laodicea is around 40 miles away from Philadelphia. So we have been studying about the city of Philadelphia and the church of Philadelphia. Now we come to the next and the last church that is the Laodicea church. So this city is around 40, it is, is away from 40 miles away from Philadelphia. And also, what is the old name of the city that is there, okay? Diapolis, Diapolis is the old name of this city. But what happened in BC 250, Antiochus II, Antiochus II, he rebuilt the city and he renamed, I mean, as Laodicea. Okay, so it was in, in the beginning, it was known as the, uh, I mean, uh, Diapolis. Then after that, in BC 250, Antiochus II, he rebuilt the city and he renamed as Laodicea as a token of his love towards his wife, I mean, Laodice. Okay, Laodice was the, I mean, uh, wife of uh, uh, Antiochus and he also was renaming uh, her name to the city of Laodicea. Okay, and now, uh, that city of uh, Laodicea is one of the one of the three cities at the side of the uh, uh, Lycus River. There was a river called Lycus River, and this city, or I mean, uh, the the city of Laodicea is one of the three cities at the side of uh, Lycus River, and the other two cities are uh, Colosse and Herapolis. Okay, there are two more uh, two more cities nearby the city of Laodicea and the nearby the side of the river Lycus, that is Colossae and Hierapolis. Then again, one more thing, the city was a banking center. The city was a banking center. You know, when I say that uh, the, the city of Laodicea was a city which was a center of banking, that means uh, which shows about the wealth of that, I mean, area, uh, the, the wealth of that uh, city. So the people, those who were staying in, in, living in that city, they were very rich and they were very wealthy people. So we'll be uh, studying about all those things in the, in, the, in the later, maybe, when we study about the messages uh, to the church at Levodesia. So we are going fast, little more fast. Uh, okay. And the city was one of the richest cities of Asia Minor. It is known as the richest cities of the Asia Minor. And also the city was a center of clothing industry. The city was a center of clothing industry. Later you will understand why we are studying all these things or the, the, the historical background of the city. And again, one more thing is there, the city was a center of ancient medicine and the uh, manufacturing of a special kind of uh, kind of eye salve, eye salve. You can you can call it as eye salve. Okay, so you know this city was famous for the center of the ancient medicine and also manufacturing of a special kind of eye salve. Okay, uh, eye salve in Malayalam uh, you can uh, uh, call it as a lebam and then a kandil kandil puratunna lebo adana malayalathil adinde kodutirikkuna vaak ai salve ennulla vaakina okay anyway 
uh, the other thing, uh, the other speciality of uh, uh, this uh, city was, um, you know, the pure and cold water was available in Kolese, the city of Kolese. The Kolese is the uh, nearest city of uh, Levadesha. Okay, so in Kolese, pure and cold water was available, and also the hot water springs were available in Hierapolis. Hierapolis also is a, one of the nearest city of Levadesha, and hot water spring were available in. Hierapolis and pure and cold water was available in Colesse. Okay, these two cities. But the interesting thing is in Levodusia, the pure water was not available. In Levodusia, the, the, the pure water was not, not available. So what happened? They brought the pure drinking water from other cities. This is the history. So they were bringing the, the pure water and the cold water, the hot water from other cities through through the, the, the huge tunnels and the pipes. They were using huge tunnels and the pipes to bring the uh, pure drinking water for this city of Levadesha. But the problem was when that water reaches to the city of Levadesha, it becomes uh, like a lukewarm water. Okay, I, I told you that they were bringing that water, that the pure water from other places, from other cities. So when they are bringing this one and when it reached to the city of Levadusia, it automatically becomes like a lukewarm water. Okay, so we will be studying about that thing in later, maybe when we are studying about the messages for the church at Levadusia. Now, we will go to the next point, point number B. Point number B, that is the establishment of the church at Laodicea. The establishment of the church at Laodicea. Okay. When we think about uh, the establishment of the church of Laodicea, that means when or uh, where or who was the uh, the person who established the church at Levodisha, uh, we understand nothing is recorded in the Bible about the establishment of the Levodisha church. But at the same time, some of the scholars, they believe that Apostle Paul uh, was, the, uh, was the establisher or the, uh, he, Apostle Paul is the person who uh, planted the church in that city uh, while he was visiting and ministering in Ephesus, and he also visited and planted a church in Levodisha. Okay, so this is what uh, some of the scholars are believing. Uh, but uh, the second thing is the other, the another group of scholars, the another group of scholars, they believe uh, Epaphras, Epaphras was the uh, was the person or was the minister who planted the church at Levodisha that we we read in. Colossians chapter 1, verse 7. Colossians chapter 1, verse 7. We'll read that verse. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Okay. So uh, uh, here, Apostle Paul says that, okay, uh, uh, Epaphras was a close person and close minister of uh, Apostle Paul. Uh, that means he was associated with, I mean, Apostle Paul. So some people believe that uh, Epaphras was the person who planted the church at Laodicea because uh, once again in, in, in Colossians chapter two, verse one, Colossians chapter two, verse one, uh, there we see that Paul, when he is writing to the Colossians, uh, the, 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 uh, the epistle of Colossians is written for the, Col the people of Colossians. And when Paul was writing uh, his letter to the Colossians, he said, uh, for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. Okay, it is particularly written that I'm writing this letter uh, and uh, I'm greeting you all the people, those who are at Laodicea and also for all who have not met me personally. That means they, the, the, a group of people, they didn't have any uh, personal I mean, uh, encounter or personal relationship with, the, I mean, Apostle Paul. So that is the reason that uh, some of the scholars says that 
uh, the people of Laodicea are not familiar with Apostle Paul. That means uh, it is not Apostle Paul who planted the church at uh, I mean, uh, Laodicea. It was Epaphras. Anyway, there are two kinds of opinions about uh, the establishment of the church at I mean, uh, uh, Laodicea. And also when we read uh, Colossians chapter uh, 4 verses 13, 15, and 16, you will read that verse also. Uh, Colossians chapter 4 verses 13, 15, and 16. Yeah. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Give my greetings to the brothers of Laodicea and Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read to the church of the Laodiceans and see that you've also read the letter from Laodicea. Okay, so uh, when you read these verses, we understand uh, uh, we understand both the people of Laodicea, uh, uh, the church, and also the people of Colossian church had a close connection in spiritual activities. That means they had a spiritual connection between the uh, people of Laodicea and also the people of Colossia. Col 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 okay, so uh, both of the churches were having a link and they were having a connection in the spiritual activities and their letters, which was written by Apostle Paul uh, to the Colossians also were read in the church at Laodicea. That is what we understand from this portion. Okay, so these are the things that we understand from the, uh, about the establishment of the church at Laodicea. Okay, now, uh, we will go to the uh, point number C. Point number C, that is threefold titles of Jesus. Threefold titles of Jesus in Revelation chapter 3, uh, verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14. Yeah, can you read that verse once again, uh, Elsa? And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen and the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Okay, you can just note down those points. At the same time, I'll be, I mean, trying to explain the points. Then only we'll be able to, I mean, complete that portion. Okay, so uh, here in this particular verse, verse 14, we see there are threefold titles of Jesus. That means Jesus is introducing himself in three ways to engage them. Okay, so why Jesus is introducing himself in different names, in different names? There is a reason. Because when the churches are going through different crises and when the churches are going through many difficult situation, you know, uh, when you study about the previous churches, maybe first church and second church and third church and fourth and fifth and sixth churches, we understand Jesus Christ is introducing himself to those churches in different ways, in different ways. Okay, here, Jesus is introducing himself and giving three titles for himself. The first one is the faithful and true witness. The faithful and true witness. This is the first title because that shows, I mean, he says that I, I'm the faithful and the true witness. That means you are receiving this message, even though it is written by Apostle, uh, Apostle John, Jesus himself is giving that message to John. Okay, so he introduced himself that I am the faithful and true witness. Jesus says, I am the faithful and true witness, which shows Jesus is the real genuine and faithful witness. Jesus is the real, genuine and faithful witness. For example, we will read, uh, I mean, two verses, one from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, then John chapter 14, verse 6. Yeah. If we are faithful, faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, so that, that, that shows that, you know, sometimes we are, we, are, we are not faithful or we are unfaithful, but Jesus remains always faithful. That means Jesus is the real person and he's the genuine person and he is the faithful witness of God. Amen. 
So that is the first introduction about Jesus or title about Jesus. And the second one is the beginning of the creation. The beginning of the creation. The beginning of the creation. Okay. When you see the beginning of the creation as the second title which is given there, that doesn't mean that Jesus is the first creation of God. Okay. Some people say that Jesus is the first creation of God, just like maybe maybe uh, you and me. You know, I am the creation of God. You are the creation of God. So some people say that okay, Jesus also is a creation, or Jesus also is a creature of God. That means Jesus is not God. But absolutely that is wrong. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Okay, so we understand when it says that he is the beginning of the creation, he is the beginning of the creation. Okay, when we say that he is the firstborn of the creation, that doesn't mean that Jesus is the Jesus is the creation of God. Rather, he is the beginner of all creation. You understand one thing? He is the beginner of all creation. He is the beginner of all creations. To understand that, I mean, particular portion, we have to, we want to go to John chapter one, I mean, uh, verses one through three. John chapter one, verses one through three, and then Hebrews chapter one, verse two. That verses will very clearly says that Jesus is the beginner of all creation. Yeah. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things are made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. But, but in these last days he was spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So these two verses or these verses speaks, I mean, very clearly says that, okay, I mean, this, I mean, the beginning of the creation doesn't mean that Jesus is the creation of God or Jesus is the first creation of God, rather, he is the beginner of all creation, I mean, so now we will go to the third uh, title of Jesus Christ and how Jesus is introducing himself uh, and in, in third point, that is the amen. Point number third is the amen. No, that is what we read in that verse to angel of the church in Laodicea, right? The amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The amen. What is the meaning of that usage? The amen. Jesus Christ is the amen. Okay. Whenever we pray, we used to say, okay, amen. That means after the prayer, we are just closing our prayer by saying amen. What is the meaning of that? The meaning of that amen is as it is or yes, it is like that only and may it be or surely or certainly or unchanging and trustworthy. These are the meanings of that amen. Yes or may it be surely, certainly, unchanging and trustworthy. That's what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Yes. Whatever God says or whatever Jesus says, it is amen. That means that is right and that is going to happen. Okay. There is, if, if God says no, it is no. If God says yes, that is yes okay so that is the meaning of that i mean usage and these are the three titles that we can see in revelation chapter 3 verse 14 now we will go to the uh, next uh, main point that is the point number d point number d messages to the church at levadesia messages to the church at levadesia is the point number d and that is the main point that is from revelation chapter 3 verses 15 through 18. Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. <clears throat> and under that, the first point, then maybe point number A, small A, okay? It's not capital A, but it is small A, is weak points. Weak points, okay? Whenever we were studying about 
the the other churches we have been studying about the weak points of those churches okay now here also the church at levadesha also is having mainly two kinds of weak points in their life in the in the church so that is that is what we read in uh, uh, verses 15 through 17 okay 15 through 17 we can see that now we will go to the uh, what are the weak points of the churches okay so we understand one thing after a keen observation jesus tells them about the about the real spiritual condition of the church okay so the, 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 there is a keen observation so uh, jesus christ is very clearly observing the church at levadesha and he is bringing something about that church and saying that this is the real spiritual condition of the church okay so uh, uh, the first one the first weak point that is mentioned there is i mean you are neither cold or hot but lukewarm right you are neither cold or hot but you are lukewarm in in verse 15 okay i know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot i wish that you were cold or hot but because you are lukewarm okay sheedavanumalla ushnavanumalla sheedoshnavan athre ennu parnjirikkunu okay you know actually uh, i need at least one hour to explain this point so i'll be uh, i mean uh, I, I, i'll be doing or i'll do one thing i will just give the point then uh, if uh, type permit then i will preach a sermon on uh, this point in any of the upcoming uh, sundays otherwise it is not uh, easy to finish that point uh, within this i mean uh, maybe half an hour or something okay so we will leave that point just i'll give you that points only then after that if 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 uh, uh, i mean god allows we will be uh, thinking about that point uh, in one of the sundays Uh, in upcoming days okay so the second uh, weak point of the levodation church is uh, self sufficiency self sufficiency is the second um, i mean weak point of that church okay so that is from chapter 3 verse 17 self sufficiency <clears throat> that is the that is the second weak point about the church at uh, levodation that is from chapter 3 verse 17 uh, can you read that verse uh, just 17 verse elsa for you say i am rich i have prospered and i need nothing not realizing that you are wretched pitiful poor blind and naked okay in in different uh, translation city there are different uh, i mean words are used there but even all the words are same meaning okay now we will go to the uh, the first i mean the first thing about the self sufficiency is they were proud about their financial wealth they were proud about their financial wealth okay how can we say that they were they were proud about their financial wealth so uh, jesus says that okay, that is one of the one of the weak point of your church what is that they were proud about their financial wealth that means they believed that they are self sufficient they believed that they are self sufficient okay what happens when a church or when a, when, a, when a person is just thinking that okay i am self sufficient that means i don't want anybody's help or i don't want i mean god's intervention in my life when i am enough and i don't want anything or anybody to help me or to support me but so that was the situation of that levodishan church they were believing that they are self sufficient and again they says they are rich okay in the same words it is there they are rich the next two thing is they think they have become wealthy they think they have become wealthy and the next one is they think they have need of nothing they think they have need of nothing but the interesting thing is the spirit of the lord is clearly saying one thing in that particular words that they think that they are self sufficient 
they think they are rich. They think that they have become wealthy people and they think they have need of nothing. But they are not knowing that they are wretched, miserable, poor and blind and naked. This is very seriously we have to think about. You know, those people, the people of the church at Levodisha, they were thinking that they are rich and they are wealthy and they, they have need of nothing and they are self-sufficient, everything. But the Spirit of the Lord is saying that after the observation, or Jesus says that, okay, you are not, no, you are not knowing that you are wretched, you are miserable, and you are poor, and you are blind, and you are naked. Okay, these are the things that we can understand from the first thing that they were proud about their financial wealth. Financial wealth. The second, the next one is. They were proud about the clothing trade. Listen, they were proud about the clothing trade. That is the point number B. Or the second one. They were proud about the clothing trade. Um, so I, I, as I told you earlier, the garments made there or in that city of Levodicia were famous over all the world. Okay. So I was, I was, I mean, saying about the, uh, industry, the, the, the clothing industry or something. Okay, so uh, that's, the, that's the reason I said the garments which was made uh, in that city, it was famous for uh, all, the, all over the world. And the wool of the sheep of Levodicia was luxury article. Okay, so this was made out of the city of Levodicia. So that wool of the sheep or that garments uh, of that Levodicia was luxury article. So they were proud about the self-sufficiency of the clothing trade. So they were well known in that trade and they were wealthy in that trade. So that's the reason they were just proud about, they were always boasting about that we are self-sufficient people and we have that the clothing trade and we have the wealth and the richness and everything. So we are self-sufficient. So this is the second thing. And the third one, third one is, they were proud about the famous I Salve. They were proud about the famous I Salve. That was the, I mean, that already I told you that uh, the Labam, Kandil Metpuratana, Labam, that is the I Salve. Okay. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the words, uh, it is there in the, um, yeah, 18th verse, it is there. Okay. So they were proud about the famous I Salve. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the city was a center of ancient medicine and also the manufacturing uh, of a special kind of uh, eye salve. So they were proud about those things. Okay, uh, you know, one thing uh, I, I think I told you uh, earlier, uh, they were just proud about all those things. Okay, they were saying that okay, we, we are the center of the ancient medicine. So we have that uh, collection of the medicine and we have the facility to uh, facility to produce the medicine and we are manufacturing the special kind of eye salve. That means that is not available anywhere. Only in this city, we are getting this eye salve or this labum. Okay, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of ointment. Okay, so we are getting this one and we are getting rich and rich. I mean, because of the uh, ointment or because of this special kind of ice salve, this is available in our place only. So they were proud about all those things. But the problem is, the, but the problem is, they are not knowing that they are spiritually wretched and they are spiritually miserable and they are spiritually poor and they are spiritually blind and spiritually naked. That is what we read in verse 17. Verse 17, it says that, those people, they were not knowing about what is the spiritual condition of those people. Physically, materially, in all other ways, they were so rich and they were proud about all those things. And they were talking uh, many things about uh, the self-sufficiency and everything. But unfortunately, they were not knowing that spiritually, they were dull, they were wretched and they were miserable. They were poor 
and blind and naked. That's what we read uh, from verse 17. Okay, so uh, when I was thinking and when I was studying about, uh, I mean, these portions, uh, I was just thinking like, uh, uh, this, is, this is what is happening in today's Christian churches also, that uh, uh, people are living only to make money or wealth, right? The people are living only for money, okay? They are uh, living and they are working. Uh, they are doing the job only for earning money or making money. And some are thinking that uh, uh, they are self-sufficient. That means no need of anything, uh, no need of God or no need of anything, okay? Any, any support or need uh, from others. Okay? That, is, that, is the, that is the way they are living and uh, they are saying. So that means they are loving the gift and the material things more than the giver. This is one of the dangerous thing that, uh, which is happening in our Christian churches today. What is that? Then they are always looking for the gift and the people are looking for the material things and blessings more than the giver. So Jesus is giving all the, all the gift for the people, but they are always, I mean, looking for the gift and they are enjoying that gift without the giver. So there is, there is no relationship. They don't, they don't have any relationship with God the giver of the gift, rather enjoying the gifts and uh, uh, blessings always. But Jesus is giving a solution for this critical uh, situation in the, in, the, in the verse 18, okay? The problem, their problem is they are enjoying in all the material blessings and richness <clears throat> and wealth, okay? So they say that we are self-sufficient. We don't have, we don't want anything, okay? We have everything. So it is enough, okay? We have everything, we have everything, we are wealthy. And we are rich people, okay? So, but the, but the problem is different, okay? Spiritually, they are facing many problems, okay? This is, this is the same thing which is happening in, in the Christian churches today. But uh, uh, Jesus is giving the solution for those crises and for those situations, okay? What is that? The solutions are, I mean, threefold in verse 18. In verse 18, okay, read that verse 18. That's all. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and slave to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Okay, there are threefold solutions for their problem, their spiritual problem. <clears throat> okay, so God is not concerned about what is the material problem of those people, <clears throat> but Jesus is always concerned about the spiritual problem of those people. So that's the reason in verse 18, Jesus is giving threefold solutions for the spiritual problem or to solve the spiritual uh, pathetic condition of those people. Okay, so uh, Jesus is giving an, giving an advice, advice as a solution for their problem. It is an advice for the solution of that problem. What is the solution number one? That is buy the gold the refined in the fire, okay? By the gold, which is refined in fire. By the gold, which is refined in fire. So the gold went through the crucial experiences and process of refining fire, which stands for the strong faith of a believer, okay? The first solution and the first advice, which Jesus is giving for the people of Laodicea is you are supposed to buy the gold. You are supposed to buy the gold, which is refined in the fire, which is refined in the fire. So what is that? Usually the gold is going through a crucial experiences and the process of refining fire. Then only that fire or that gold will be getting more and more glory. Okay, so that is, that is standing for the strong faith of a believer. That means if a person is getting the strong faith, if a believer is, is strong and firm in faith, that person will be very strong, even though that person is going through the crucial experience of, of his life. That's what we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. Okay. So that the tested geniusness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through 
though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay. So our faith is tested through the fire, the, through the fire. That means this trial, the, the trials and the temptations and the struggles. Okay, so we have to understand one thing. It is not possible for us to buy the righteousness of God. It is not possible for us to buy the salvation of God and the lost glory of God. Okay, but by faith, it is possible. By faith, it is possible. Okay, so that's what we read. You know, when Adam and Eve, they, when they were uh, doing sin and they, when they were fallen in the Garden of Eden, they lost the garment. They lost the garment of glory of God. Okay, they were clothed with the glory of God. They lost it. Then after that, God himself is coming down from heaven and giving some, I mean, temporary arrangement for those people. And after that, the permanent arrange arrangement was Jesus Christ who came to this world and he died. And that was the solution for the, I mean, sinful man, uh, uh, sinful nature of the people. So that is what we understand. Okay. So the first solution that Jesus is giving to them is by the God, which is refined in the fire. That means you have to come back to the faith in Jesus Christ. That means your, your faith must be very, 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 very strong. Okay. So that is the first one. And the second one, second solution which is written in the same words it is by the white garments by the white garments that means you have to buy the white garments okay this doesn't speaks about okay you you go to the you go to the shop tomorrow and uh, uh, get a get a white garment or something this is speaking about some other things okay that means big cloth with the white garments so that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed that it is written there okay so when you are clothed with the white garment so that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed that means uh, already we have seen that the, the the situation or the condition of the church was when naked okay they were blind and they were naked and they were wretched and all those things okay so now he is, I mean, giving the solution that you go and get a get a white garment, or or buy the white garment because by, when you are clothing with a white garment, that will white garment so that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And the white garment in the Bible speaks about the garment of the holiness and also the righteousness. The garment of the holiness and the righteousness. Okay, so it is absolutely free but we need to purchase it. What is the difference between it is free, then how can we purchase it? How can we buy that? Okay, that is by giving a price and the price is the decision and the real faith in Jesus Christ. We are not giving anything else, only the faith in Jesus Christ. That means that should be the real faith and real decision. When a person is believing in Jesus Christ, okay? Faith and belief, that there is, a, there is a difference between faith and belief, okay? What is that? Belief means, okay, uh, uh, open heartedly, when we believe in Jesus and accepting Jesus as a personal savior, that is called the belief, okay? That we have to keep it until the death. And after that, then the second one, the faith is, okay? That we believe that, okay, uh, the faith means we believe that, okay, whatever God is promising for the people of God and he is able to do that and I will get it. That is the faith, okay? At the same time, belief is the strong faith which we have in Jesus Christ, okay? So through the faith only, we are, that means we are, we are, I mean, uh, buying or we are purchasing the holiness, the garment of the holiness and the righteousness by faith. We are giving the price only one price we are giving, that is the faith, okay? Just believing in Jesus Christ and real faith will help you to get the garment of holiness and the righteousness, okay? Now, we will go to the third solution. The third solution is, I mean, uh, by the I salve, by the I salve. 
by the I salve. It's the third solution which is uh, given to the church at Levodisha by Jesus. For what? To anoint your eyes. To anoint your eyes, then your blindness will go away. I told you, the, the spiritual situation of those people were blind. Okay, so they were blind in spirit. So uh, here Jesus says that you go and buy the eyes salve to anoint your eyes, then your blindness will go away and you will be able to see the spiritual truth of the word of God. It speaks about the Holy Spirit. Okay, when the Holy Spirit is working in a person and that person's eyes will be opened and that person's nakedness, spiritual nakedness and spiritual blindness will be going away and that person will be able to see the spiritual truths of the word of God. So that is the, I mean, Holy Spirit, just like an anointing or just like, a, like, a, like an ointment, we can call it as a Holy Spirit. Okay, now these are the three, uh, threefold solution for the problem or the crisis, the spiritual crisis of the uh, Levodishian believers. Now, we will go to the uh, next uh, a small heading, the love of God, the love of God. That is from verses 19 and 20. 19 and 20. We will read that verses, then we will explain about that. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline to be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he will be and he with me. Okay. There are many things which we can see about the love of God. The love of God in verses 19 and 20. Okay. What is that? The love of God reproves or rebukes us. The love of God reproves or rebukes us. Why God is rebuking the people? Why God is reproving the people? Why God is disciplining the people? Because he loves us. Second thing, love of God disciplines us. It is written there. Love of God will discipline us. Third one. Love of God stands at the door of our heart. Love of God stands at the door of our heart. Fourth one. Love of God knocks at the door of our heart. Love of God knocks at the door of our heart. Fifth one. Love of God desires to come in us and to dine with us. Love of God desires to come in us and to dine with us. So these are the five things that we, uh, that is mentioned about the love of God in verses 19 and 20, okay? When God is loving a person, God will reprove that person, God will rebuke that person, God will uh, discipline that person, Okay, love of God stands at the door of her heart. Okay, and knocking at the door of her heart. If we are ready to open our heart and accept Jesus as a personal savior inside the heart, amen, that love of God will desiring to come in us, to come in us and to dine with us or to have a dinner with us, amen. So God's presence is always there. And when he loves the person, he will do something. Maybe sometimes he will rebuke the people. He will discipline the people and always standing at the door of a heart, always standing and knocking at the door, door of a heart and also desiring to come in, uh, in us and to dine with us. These are the specialities, five specialities of the love of God, which is mentioned in verses 19 and 20. Now we will go to the point number E. e that is the promise of reward. That is the last point, okay? The promise of reward. Point number E, the promise of reward. That is from chapter 3, verse 21. <clears throat> promise of reward, chapter 3, verse 21. Yeah, shall we read that verse? 
The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered this, this and sat down with my father on his throne. Amen. So, what is that? When Jesus said, I will grant to him who overcomes to sit with me on my throne. That means this is called that Jesus is granting or Jesus is giving that authority to sit with him. If a person is overcoming the world, then Jesus will allow that person to sit with him on his throne, on his throne. Okay, so uh, we will go to Luke chapter 22, verses 29, 30. Uh, Luke chapter 22, verses 29 and 30. There we will get a clear picture about why Jesus is saying uh, these words to the uh, to the church at Laodicea. Okay. And I assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, that's what Jesus speaks, I mean, uh, saying that about, I mean, he, he is ready to share his authority with us. Okay. He is, he is getting ready to share with uh, as the authority that he has. Okay, he has the authority to do anything. That same authority, Jesus is planning to share with the people of God if we are overcoming the world. Okay, so that is to judge the nations during the time of millennial kingdom. Okay, so during the time of millennial kingdom, okay, God, Jesus is giving the same authority to, for, for the people of God, those who are with him. Uh, I mean, in the in the millennial kingdom, then and we will be also judging the nation. I mean, with the authority of Jesus Christ. So that is going to happen after the seven years of great tribulation. Okay, tribulation after the seven years of great tribulation. So the millennial kingdom for thousand years will be coming. In that time, uh, we are going to get the authority, and we are going to sit with Jesus Christ, and we are going to rule over the nations. So that is what we understand from that. And because Jesus is the, uh, that also is written that Jesus is the overcomer. And if he overcome the world, and we also will be sitting with Jesus on the throne. Amen. So that is what we understand. And so this is the end of the study of chapters one to three. And the study about the seven churches of Asia Minor. Okay. So this is the end of these studies. Uh, we have been studying about the seven churches and uh, what are the messages which was given for those churches and all those points. And if the coming of the Lord tarries, we will be studying from chapter four through chapter 22. Okay. If time allows, maybe in the next class, in different method, maybe next class onwards. Okay. Uh, this we were, we were, uh, uh, thus far we have been uh, studying uh, in a systematic way and from chapter uh, chapter four onwards, that kind of uh, method, I think uh, that will not be appropriate to understand the, the things in a clear manner because we will have to connect with uh, some other books also uh, when we move on, okay? So uh, that is going to happen. So thus far we were uh, studying very systematically about the uh, things which is written in uh, chapter one, two and three uh, that was speaking about uh, seven churches in Asia Minor and their messages and all those things. But uh, we won't be able to uh, continue the same system or continue the same method of study uh, from, from chapter 4 to 22 because we will have to, uh, uh, to change that method and we will have to uh, refer uh, some of the other books also to understand. 